Uh, Jesus, so thankful that all we heard about this morning through these songs that we sing to you is love, 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 God. And today, I pray that we would know your love in deeper ways. Or that's one thing that the world just doesn't have to offer is the depth of the love of our God. I pray that we'd receive that this morning. I pray that we'd know it in our heads and know it deep down in our hearts, Lord Jesus. We know that you love the Morris family. We know that you have plans for them. We know that it's for a future and it's for a hope. And right now, Lord God, uh, we, we ask for your healing hand upon them. We ask that you touch Jen's body, that you give the doctors and nurses wisdom as, as she rests and as she heals, Lord Jesus. Would you minister to them this morning? Jehovah Rapha, God the healer, would you touch her today? And would you bless Nate? I, pr I pray for Caleb and Zoe and Josiah. I just pray that they would be um, totally unaware, that, that they would uh, be, be happy kids right now at home with their grandpa, and that you bless this situation. Lead us today, Lord God. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to give you guys one word for this morning. See if you can remember it. Lechugia. <laughs> no? Does anybody know what lechugia is? Good. We're in for a treat this morning. I'm going to read to you a little bit about this. This is a, a cave in New Mexico. And it was known until 1986 as a small, insignificant historic site in, uh, in this park's back country. Small about, amounts of bat guano were mined from the entrance for a year under a mining claim. The historic cave contained a 90-foot entrance pit known as the Misery Hole, which led to about 400 feet of dry, dead, and passages. The cave would, was visited infrequently after mining activities ceased. However, in the 1950s, cavers from Colorado, by the way, uh, heard wind roaring up from the rubble-choked cave floor. Although there was no obvious route, people concluded that cave passages lay below the rubble. So they began digging in 1984. And since the breakthrough into large walking passages occurred in 1986, explorers have mapped over 138 miles of passages. Lechugia Cave offers more than extreme size. It holds a variety of rare, I'm not even going to, tr I practice these words, I'm not going to try to say them, okay? Really cool cave things. <laughs> Can you imagine going out until, we, we, we love to explore wilderness. We love to be uh, out adventuring. I mean, that's part of why we live in Colorado, right? Whether it's on an ATV, whether it's hiking, we, we, whether it's out skiing or snowboarding, we just love adventure. Can you imagine being out someday, and you're, you're, on, uh, you're on somebody else's property, not necessarily trespassing, but let's just say you're on somebody's property, and you, you, you kind of stumble, and you look down, and you're like, that earth doesn't look right. And you kind of start to move some of the grass, dead grass away, and some of the plants, and you're like, I think there's something here, and you start to dig, and you realize you were right. There is something special here. There's something that lies beneath the ground, and as you're digging, digging, it becomes more apparent to you that it's, a, it's an old treasure box. And it's, and it's old because you can tell by the lock, you can tell by the, by the rivets instead of the screws in it. You just, your, your, your mind starts wandering and running, saying, what is inside of this box? You open up the box finally, and you see one of the most precious treasures ever known to mankind. But it's not yours. Even though you found it, it's not yours. So you hide it, you put all the earth back over it, and you go, and you go and you tell your spouse, we're going to sell our house. We're going to sell our cars. We're going to have to pull the kids from school right now because we can't afford it. We might have to live off hot dogs and bread for a while. Now, your spouse would look at you and probably think you're crazy until you tell them about the treasure that you found. You see, you take all the money, all the resources that you've gained up to go buy this piece of land, to go actually buy, not the land, but the treasure that's, whole, that's, that's held within the land. Today we're going to be looking into a, a parable. In Matthew 13, verse 44 through 46, says, Jesus is teaching us, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again, sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. The second parable Jesus tells, it's kind of similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Now, if you don't know what a parable is, that's okay. Parable is, is an earthly story with a heavenly principle, something that people could relate to. Everybody loves stories, right? 
I can tell because when I'm telling a story, you're all looking at me. And then when I stop telling a story, you stop looking at me, okay? (laughs) Stories are engaging. We sit around the campfire and we enjoy stories. Well, Jesus knew this. And oftentimes he's like, I've got something to teach you. But if I just told you how it was, you might go, yeah, okay. But if I tell you a story that's engaging, it's gonna make you think. Well, Jesus later would go on to explain different parables. Interestingly enough, there's not a a lot of of, uh, deep explanation or teaching, again, by Jesus on these things. But he tells these, uh, these parables. And a lot of people today think that these parables are actually about us. And I think there's, there's some, um, there, there can be some relation to us. But this morning, I'd love to propose a different idea. What if the man in this story, or what if the merchant in this story was actually Jesus? Let's walk through this together. Let's see if that's plausible. Let's see if that's possible. Think about Jesus being the man. We know that he was a man, right? He came down incarnate, in flesh. He was God but he was also a man. So Jesus is a man who finds a treasure in a field, thought it was great worth, so he bought it. Or excuse me, he he would give up everything that he had in order to get it. Now think about Jesus being the merchant. The merchant in Jesus' time was uh, someone who typically would travel from a faraway place in order to buy and sell goods in a different place. Well, Jesus, we know, came from right before the throne of God and came as a baby, as flesh. And so did he come from a faraway place? Yes. So far we don't see why Jesus couldn't be that, but let's explore this a little further. It says in the story that, that this man was, uh, was out in a field and then all of a sudden he found a treasure. Or he was in, in, a, in a merchant type situation and he was, uh, he was looking for a treasure. He was looking to trade something. And do you think Jesus was really looking for treasure? I mean, if we look in Revelation 21, 21, it says that there are streets of gold in heaven. That's not a made-up thing. There are actually streets of gold in heaven. And it's also surrounded by, guess what, pearly gates. I don't know if St. Peter's standing there or not, but we know that there are pearly gates in heaven. So do you think Jesus was trying to tell, uh, to tell us that he was actually looking for monetary wealth? I don't think so. Because remember, he's telling this parable, something earthly, in order to relate to something spiritual. So what might these items represent? What might be something so valuable to Jesus that he would give up all that he had in order to buy them? I'll give you a hint. Think about the end zone of a football field. The wheels are turning, right? What do you mean? Is Jesus an NFL fan? I don't know. I bet he he loves the people on the football field. What do I mean, the end zone of a football field? What sign do you always see throughout the field goal posts? What do you see? We see hands up. What do we see? Who's holding up the poster board? John Castillo is always at the game somehow, holding up this sign that says John 3, 16. So how is that a hint? Well, let me read it to you. And here's, time time out for a second. I don't want to lose you here. Because the reality is, is if you've been going to church For any amount of time, you probably have this one memorized. And it's probably so easy that you could wake up in the middle of the night and say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Or some version of that. Don't check out. Because this is one of the most simplistic ways, verses in the Bible, where the gospel is being shared. Let me break it down because sometimes when, uh, when, when we hear something over and over, It's good to hear it in a fresh way. So this is the new Luke version this morning, okay? God loved you. And God loved your neighbor. And God loved your coworkers. And God loved that annoying person that you can't stand so much that he said to Jesus, son, I need you to do a mission for me. And Jesus said, father, I'll do it out of obedience because I love you. And I love those people. So God sent his only son that if we believe in him, and I'm not talking about a head belief, like saying, well, yes, I believe Jesus exists. In fact, it tells us in James that even the demons know about about Jesus. And they shudder, it says. So it's not about knowing things about Jesus. 
But he's talking about if you know Jesus, and today, you guys, we're gonna be talking about knowing our God and his love for us. So because God said to Jesus to go to the earth and save people from their sins, that if we believe in him and say, yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, I know I need grace, and I receive that, and I, I repent, and I turn, and I want to follow you. Well, guess what? Then we're going to have everlasting life with God in heaven. It's that simple. And that's why that verse is so beautiful, because it's so simple. So in these two parables, could we see the man who finds a treasure, or the man who goes off as a merchant looking from a faraway land to find something of great value, of great worth. And when he found it, then what happens? It says that he gave up everything for it in order to obtain it, in order to bring it to himself, in order to make it his lawful possession. You're gonna read those parables differently now, aren't you? That we have a God who loves us so much that he would give up even his own life for each of us. Common thought that I think people might express. How can I know that God loves me? I want to read to you from Romans 5, 7 through 8. It says, Scarcely a righteous man, for scarcely a righteous man, one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another very common verse and another one that we can easily check out on. But guys, do you, do you read the implications as I read them? Do you understand it in, in such a depth the way that, that, that we can read it? Think about this. We might say that we would die for our children or die for our spouse, right? We love them. This is what this verse is saying. Sometimes somebody would die for a righteous man or a good person. But here's what Jesus did. He upped the, he upped the ante, if you will. He died for somebody that didn't like him, that didn't love him back. Let me make this a little bit more personal this morning. That person at work that drives you nuts, that person that may have harmed you in a certain way, that person that may have lied about you behind your back, now think about dying for them. If you're anything like me, that's not only challenging, but I would say in my own strength, impossible. I just, well, why? Why in the world would I choose to die for someone that didn't do anything good for me? I would give up my own life. I would give up my, my relationship with my kids. I would give up my relationship with my wife. I would give up living in Vail, Colorado in order for what? That I would die for someone that's rude, that doesn't deserve it? But you guys, isn't that exactly what Jesus did? It's easy for me to think sometimes and be like, well, yeah, Jesus died for me and that's easy to die for me. You remember the uh, parable of the, the plank and the speck? And how it says, how can you who have a plank, something huge in your life, you try to help someone. Imagine having, me having a plank in my eye and I ask Heather, Heather, come here, you've got a little speck, let me help you with it. It doesn't work very well, does it? But it's, Jesus would tell us, first take the plank out of your own eye so that you can see clearly. The reality is, you guys, is if we look at ourselves, I always liked this one when I was a kid, if you're pointing your finger at someone, guess what? Three pointing back at you. It's a good one. The reality is, is you guys have all your sin, your, all the bad stuff to deal with. That's not mine to deal with for you. That's yours and your Lord's. I have enough of my own to deal with. And when I come in that way and I recognize Yes, I've been redeemed. Yes, Jesus has set me free. Yes, the blood of Christ has, has, has made me new. And yet still, day by day, I mess up. I make people upset. I say rude things. I get angry. And every day I need to be refreshed with the thought that while I was still sinning, Christ died for me. And each day, you guys, each time that you mess up and you will mess up, you might even be messing up right now and saying something, saying something nasty about me in your head. <laughs> and guess what? Jesus loves you. 
and he already died for that sin. Here's a mind blower, ready? He knows the sin that I will commit in five years from now. He knows the sin that if I make it 50 years from now, that I will commit. And he says in his word, as far as the east is from the west, which there's no marker for that, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. Jesus has already forgiven me of something I haven't even known that I've done yet. Mind blown. That's how much God loves each of us. That's how much Jesus, even though he knew that while we were still sinning, he would be on the cross saying, Luke, I love you. I'm dying for you so that you can be bought back from death. So that you can live in paradise with me, the thief on the cross. Talk about a deathbed confession. He's hanging there. And he says to Jesus, said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Whew. But the nice thing is, is we don't have to wait that long. We have the opportunity today to receive Christ's forgiveness and receive his love. Check this out. It goes on in Romans 5, 10 through 11. For if when we were enemies of God through sin, okay? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, we were brought back to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He bought us back with his death and now we get to be saved by his life. And not only that, it says in verse 11, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Because of our sin, we are all enemies of God. Because of the, let's, let's, let's talk about what sin is. It's here's, here's, a per, here's perfection, let's pretend this is perfection. And it's like shooting an arrow and you miss the mark. That's what sin is. It's missing the perfect mark of God. And because of that, we are counted as enemies towards God. And yet, because God loved us so much that he would give up his own life. God chose to love us before we loved him. May we never doubt God's love for us. Why? Because he proved it for us on the cross. So what does that mean that God loves us? Well, how do we, how do we respond to that? How do we, how do we um, leave these doors today and respond in that love? Because again, I say, God doesn't only want us to know about his love, but God wants us to know about his love. God wants us to experience his love, but then not just hold it inside, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. He wants us not only to experience God's love, but also to pour out his love. I won't go too much into the Greek, but there's four different types of love. There's storge, which is a love for family, phileo, which is a, a brotherly love, eros, which is a, a sexual or physical type love, and there, then there's, as Pastor Nate has taught us, agape. I still have trouble with that. Agape. This is a love that doesn't, change under any circumstance. This is a love that gives without demanding something. Or this is a love that uh, gives without needing something in return. This is a love that's a self-denying love in order to bless someone else. Jesus gives us a, a couple different glimpses of this. or It tells us how to respond in this. That we've received this love and now we're called to pour out this love. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, said Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus' command to, to those who know, have experienced his love, is to also give that love. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13, verse one through three, we've heard this at a thousand weddings before. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, agape, I have become a sounding brass or clanging cymbals. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move, remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You know what I always read when I read this? Keep it real simple for us. If we do things apart from Christ's love, from that self-sacrificing, that all-giving love, all we're doing is making noise. 
There's a lot of amazing organizations out there that do good things for this world. But Jesus is saying, you can do all kinds of good things in this world. But without doing it in the love of Jesus Christ, they're just making noise. When we go, we have a mission team in Houston right now. You know how they left? They left with the Great Commission of Jesus saying, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They left with Christ leading them in that. So is God going to bless the good that they're doing? You bet. Why? Because he's at the center of it. He's leading it. He's infiltrating it. And he's going to pour out through it. We can do all kinds of good things. But if it's without Jesus, those things aren't going to last for eternity. But with Christ as our center, leading us and us loving in his name, oh man, can he touch that and bless that. And not just for this life, but for eternity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Paul finishes that great love chapter and says, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest is love. Why is that the greatest? There's lots of different thoughts and theories, and I've kind of settled on one for me. In heaven, we're not gonna need to have faith because we're gonna be able to see the throne room. We're gonna be able to see the king of kings and lord of lords. So we're not gonna need the faith. Our faith is, we got it. We won the prize. We're not going to need hope because we already have what we've hoped for, the thing that we've longed for. But guess what will be there for now and through the rest of eternity? Love. Why? Because God is love. And that love doesn't stop once we make it past those pearly gates. That love continues over and over and over. The thought is, is the angels sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it says that they sing that through eternity. You know, sometimes we sing a song, we're like, okay, let's go on to the next one. Can we just move on? And yet I can just imagine the angels in heaven being surrounded by God's love, found in God's love, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Hey guys, one more time. Okay, let's do it again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's sing it slower this time. Holy, holy. I just imagine them being like, we can't stop singing it. He's here. He is love. Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, somebody said, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. By the way, Luke adds strength in there, just so you guys know. Jesus says this is the first, like if you get anything right, this is what you need to get right, okay? Okay. You need to love God with all that's in you. You need to love him with your thoughts. You need to love him with your actions. You need to love him with your words. You need to love him by what you do. And then he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. That doesn't mean just in proximity, but anybody that you come in contact with is your neighbor. Somebody at your work is your neighbor. That annoying person that you can't stand is your neighbor. And Jesus says, love them. On these two commandments hang all the law, all the things that are are the first five books of the Bible. It's considered the law. All of that hangs on this. And then the prophets in between, all of what they are saying is that God loves you. And he doesn't need you to love him back. But man, when we do, can just imagine that smile on that daddy's face. For those of us with kids, we know what happens when our kids love us. It just melts our heart. My daughter, Elliot, this morning, um, last night, she said um, that she wanted to come to church with me. And she's five, so she's kind of at that age. You know, she's a pretty good five-year-old that, that can take instruction and not just like run down to the river or out in the road or anything. So she wants to come to church with me. And I said, baby, if you're, if you're up in the morning, you can totally come to me. But I, but you know, she has a busy school week, so I want her to get sleep. So she wasn't up, and I left. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from my wife about two minutes after I left. And I just hear this sobbing in the background. And I'm like, what's going on? She said, Daddy, I wanted to come to church with you. I said, oh, baby. And I, and I said to Elisha, I'm like, can you get her ready within 10 minutes? I can come back, and I'll come get her. Oh, 
She loves me. (laughs) She wants to spend time with me. Here's the other thing, you guys. What she really wants is to spend time with you. Why? Because of Jesus in you. She feels that. A lot of our kids feel that, that love that you pour out. Why do we have layers upon layers of greeters? So that people can feel loved and not get missed. Why do we put out coffee and donuts? One, so you won't be cranky. (laughs) More importantly, because we love you. And because we think that that's, if, if that would feed somebody's belly and let them feel loved and welcomed, that's what we're gonna do. So many of the things that we do as a staff, why do we do Fall Fun Night? 740 people, by the way, came in through our doors for Fall Fun Night. Thank you for those who helped out. Amen. Why do we do it? Not so we can be the cool church in the valley, but so that our community might know the love of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna sum it up. The man, the merchant, came and saw something so valuable that he just had to have it and would give all that he would have in order to make it his. It's not a stretch to say that Jesus was sharing that about his love for us. Do you see today that God loves you? Yes, I'm talking to the person next to you, but I don't want you to think that I'm just talking to them because I'm talking to each and every single person sitting in here today. Do you know, do you know that God loves you. You guys, we don't need to look further than the cross. And then he's blessed us with crazy, amazing things on top of that. Do we have troubles? Yes. Do we have trials? Yes. Do we have circumstances that are are so challenging? We feel like giving up sometimes? Yes. And that's what we've been learning in the book of Philippians, right? Paul was in jail, chained to a, to a, a, a guard. He was not in a great circumstance. But as Pastor Nate's been sharing, it's not about our circumstances. It's about knowing and knowing the love of our God for us, no matter what our circumstances are. Do you know that today? How much he loves you and how much he values you. You see, God has set your value. People around you can try to set your value. Well, you're worth $100,000. You're worth $1 million. I have life insurance. They tell me how much I'm worth. They're like, "Eh, you're not worth more than that. Okay, okay. Through our job status, we, people can try to value us. Through how well we perform, people can try to value us. The reality is, is God values you to the point of he's given himself up completely for you. You have the highest value on your life and it's not from somebody that's gonna change their mind when you do something wrong. It's by a God who knows you inside and out, has created you for a purpose. So how does that make you wanna respond? For me, It makes me feel free. Just makes me shake off the the things that the world has labeled me or put on me or thoughts that I might even uh, have entertained from the enemy. Makes me feel light. Makes me feel like I can trust God. It makes me feel, uh, it makes me want to explore the depths of his love more. It makes me want to please him. It makes me want to share with anybody else who would listen about God's love for them. And it really challenges me and makes me want to love others like Jesus. I just want to, I want to be more like him. I want to be less like the old man and I want to be more like Jesus. And praise God that he's working that out in me and through any believer. He's working that out in you. He's not finished with you yet. Today we get to celebrate the ultimate picture of Jesus' love for us through communion. On the night that he was going for the cross, he had, uh, he had communion, or he had the, uh, the Passover meal set out, and even the one that he knew would betray him, Judas, was there. And guess what Jesus did? He washed his feet. There's no reason for us to think that Judas was left out of that. But Jesus got into the, to, to the servant role that night and he got down in the dirtiest spot of people's lives and he washed them clean. And then after, uh, it said during supper, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And this is my cup. It's the new covenant. It's the new work that my father and I have planned from even before time began to right now it's coming to its fulfillment by the shedding of my blood. And I bet you some of the disciples were pretty confused. 
And yet I bet you something was stirring inside of them saying, I know how much he loves me. Just feel his love. We see John leaning against Jesus. God isn't some distant, far away God that we need to keep our, keep our space from. We can lean right into him. Paul would write that we have a, a spirit that cries within us, Abba, Father, Daddy. We have that through what Jesus has done. So would you guys stand with me this morning? And we're going to begin to, to worship. And, and it's good to feel good, right? It's good to feel loved. But God doesn't intend for us to come for one hour on a Sunday and feel good. God intends for us all throughout the week to read his love story for us. Even in the hard parts where we can't quite see or understand his love, he wants us to to be in here and know the depths of his love for us. He wants us to experience his love on a daily basis even when we don't feel like it. And you guys, probably especially when we don't feel like it. He wants us to know that he loves us and there's not a thing you can do about that. God loves you and it's such a simple message. But don't let that message just fly by you because you've heard it before. Don't let the message... Uh, run by you because you've, you've uh, already experienced God's love. Do you know how deep his love is for you? You can't. It says in his word. Do you know how wide, how high his love is for you? You can't. But we can certainly explore that. And just like that cave, the more you dig, the more you uncover, the more you realize, wow, this thing is bigger than I could have ever imagined. And praise you, God, that you love me in that way, no matter what. I'm going to be... Um, I'm going to be off to the side if anybody needs some prayer today. Oh, here's the other thing. If this is the first time that you've, that you've heard about God's love for you, then praise God that you are here today hearing his love for you. He wants you to respond in a way. If maybe you've heard this before, but you haven't responded to his love before, why not today? Ask yourself that. Why not today? This could be the day of your salvation that you put that stake in the ground and said, today is the day that I've received Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And for those of you that, are, that have been walking with the Lord, know today that he still loves you. He just does. He still loves you. And he's proved it for you. So would you guys bow your heads with me? I'm gonna pray for anybody that... that, uh, that uh, has not received Jesus as their, their Lord and their Savior before. It's a really simple thing. You can use your own words or you can use my words. Um, today, would you, would you pray? Jesus, thank you for loving me that while I was still sinning, Christ died for me. Jesus, you chose to love me. You chose to die for me. And I know that I've done things in my life that I'm not proud of and I've done things in my life that um, you'd consider sin. I ask that you wash those things fresh and new today. Though my my sins be like scarlet, would you wash me as white as snow? And Lord, I want to receive you as my Lord. I want to receive you as my Savior, the one who saved my soul from separation with you. Lord God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And would you continue to walk with me all the days of my life that I may dwell in the house of of yours forever, Lord God. Amen. Here's the cool thing. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. We're not perfect. We like to have fun. And we love serving our Jesus together. If you, ha- if you did pray that prayer this morning, um, if you'd come talk to me or come talk to uh, one of our, one of our uh, prayer team, that'd be great. Let's worship together and we can take communion.
heart was a storm I was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't run couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run couldn't run from his arms Jesus he loves me he loves me he is for me Jesus how can it be he loves I'll never be the same I stepped out of the dark And into the light When he called my name I couldn't run, couldn't run From his presence We go in your love today. Let us be led by you. Thank you that you found us, that you rescued us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Have a wonderful day. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence.